Today, we talk about creativity and outcomes in the classroom. Hello, and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 27. Today is December 8th, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart, calling from the city of Aguascalientes, Mexico. Good morning, everybody. This is Piri Herrera, also here in Aguascalientes, in a, a fresh morning here. Um, and hoping you are all well and you are uh, enjoying the weekend if you are not working and the ones that are heading to work, well, uh, join us for a while. Today, we'll be discussing a little bit uh, about interesting things that we've been uh, talking before. But um, first of all, welcome welcome everybody from uh, Facebook Live also, from YouTube streaming. And uh, we are glad that you join us to talk about education. Absolutely. We're also on Periscope today, trying this out as well. So uh, welcome if you're uh, joining us. Uh, we're finishing up the semester, PD. Almost, uh, I think we've got one more week of uh, classes and then a few more days to wrap up uh, this semester. I know um, it's been a crazy Christmas season as far as getting out during the weekends or throughout the week if you're lucky enough uh, to have that opportunity, uh, trying to get around and get uh, Christmas presents purchased and the whole bit. So hopefully you're all are getting ready, geared up for the Christmas season. I know uh, we are. Yes, the most wonderful <laughs> um, time in the year that we can enjoy and we can do a lot of stuff, but at the same time, in, in the school area, closing a little bit. Uh, some of people here in Aguascalientes, well, in Mexico, they're closing half of the cycle in, in regular school, in public schools. And we at the Universidad Autónoma, we are also finishing another semester. And uh, what is left is to grade some final papers and, and go through feedbacks and uh, reflections that we've been doing with the students. Uh, but uh, enjoying the time as always. And what I enjoy about education is the change that it brings every single time, right? Yeah, um, the, the, the broadcast that we're doing on a weekly basis, we're hoping that since things are kind of calming down, hopefully for many of you who are watching, uh, if anyone has some spare time and wants to join us in the conversation, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we have a Facebook page. I think the easiest way would be just to reach out to us and let us know any topics that you would like to discuss or any topics that you would like to discuss that we haven't in the past, or maybe if you'd like for us to revisit a topic and uh, address it again, we would certainly be happy to do that. Uh, we have been and we've been getting into the habit now of uh, inc including the link to the to the broadcast. So if you want to join us, just want to pop in and and have some uh, comments and opinions about what we're talking about. Free, feel free to do that. Uh, we uh, want uh, to make this as participative as possible, and and want your voice to be heard. So let us know if you want to jump in and and add to the conversation or if you want something more formally and, and want to schedule something in the future feel free to do so also if you have an event coming up that you want to promote or uh, want to uh, discuss feel free uh, to do that as well we've done that ourselves on several occasions and uh, extend that invitation to anyone who wants to uh, promote something that they're doing uh, in, in class, specifically in terms of a perf uh, performance task. We had uh, a good discussion a couple of weeks ago about a, a recent performance task at the Universidad Autónoma de Aguascalientes, and we discussed a lot about that experience, uh, what we meant as teachers, what we think some of our students took away from it uh, as learners, and um, so we want to extend that to everyone. It's not just about what we think and what our uh, sharing our own experiences. We want to try to be as inclusive as possible. So again, reach out to us if you want to be part of the conversation. And I think Facebook page certainly is the easiest. If you follow me on Twitter, of course, me directly, or if you follow uh, PD at his website, uh, that's also uh, that's also fine as well. So I just want to make sure that all of you know that. Uh, this is really not just about us. It's not just about what we think and our own opinions, but uh, want just to begin the conversation and uh, try to get as many different perspectives uh, as possible into the discussion. 
Right, we are running on different platforms. So leave a comment or give a like or something so we can know that you are right there watching or listening. Or you can do it afterwards if you're watching on the only one video. Uh, we are in Facebook Live, which is a secondary transmission, a different view, a different sound. The better sound is the main transmission, which is through YouTube in the Hangout. Um, and um, you can also leave comments there. And now we are in, on Periscope with Ben's transmission. So any way you want to uh, leave us a comment or, or whatever you want to say or ask, it's OK. So Ben, today uh, I, I wanted to talk about a, a little bit uh, something that I ran into uh, a while ago, but I retake uh, the, that idea. I, I was looking for the video again, and I ran into a different one, which is about the same topic, by Sir Ken Robinson, uh, one of the most uh, famous, I think uh, I, I found in a page that it's it's rated as uh, the, the, the talk in TED Talks that has been more watched all around the globe from all of TED Talks. And, um, and uh, this is something I watched a while ago, and he was talking about creativity. And uh, the TED Talk is under, I'm going to share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Here it is. Uh, his talk is about, uh, his topic is, do schools kill creativity? And it's a very short talk, as uh, some of the talks are mostly, most of the time. Uh, but it's very interesting, and he goes through different aspects, and um, and he's got his own style and his own way to get message, messages through. Um, he also, uh, I like the way he puts a lot of examples about what he is saying, and uh, and, and I like the uh, different ideas he's got. Um, as always, you know, there are things uh, that uh, may, may stay a little bit in the air, that need a little bit a deeper reflection. But uh, above all, I think uh, I started to match what he was saying uh, with different things that we've been discussing. Now, this is not exactly the talk I'm talking about right now. This is the most famous one he's got. Uh, but I ran into the extended version, which is uh, this one, one of the talks he gave in uh, UCLA at the um, uh, Reimagine Education Conference, uh, that would be uh, uh, at UCLA, that's, that's a talk. And uh, here it takes pretty much the idea from the short video at TED Talks, and he extended it. Uh, the interesting thing for me is that he starts to mention from a different perspective, with, from a different angle, with different words and different ways to say it, Many of the things we've been discussing here at Teacher Learning Cast about, um, about education, about planning, about evaluation, about outcomes, about uh, assessment, I mean, many of the things can be related to this. And uh, in fact, I just, uh, I, when I was watching the video, I, I requested the book and I just got it precisely two days ago. <laughs> uh, his book, uh, well, one of his books, Escuelas Creativas, creative schools um sadly yeah, well not sadly but uh unluckily i it wasn't in my mind to ask for it in english so i asked for it in spanish but um uh, i'm starting to read it and and to see again he's got a lot of examples about what's going on and one of the things uh, there are many things he says and we can start discussing this from different angles but um I want to go like a little bit uh, in in and uh, I, I try to see a little bit um, what is the most basic thing he mentions. And one of the things he mentions that I consider is 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 a basic aspect is that he pictures students uh, nowadays students as a different generation. Now that's not new, right? Every generation is different. We got. Our, our differences and we live different experiences. Science and technology go ahead through time. So it's logical that we live uh, kind of different worlds. But what caught my attention about this idea of uh, a different generation is that it actually is a very, very different generation from all generations before in the, uh, in the last century. Uh, I've been 
I was thinking about my teachers, my parents, uh, my relatives, people that I'm close with, uh, my mentors, uh, people that I work with, and and uh, I, I kind of always relate with older people than than my age is, uh, and. Uh, and yes, I was thinking like I can tell about maybe a couple of generations that I've been related to besides mine. So that'll do three. And uh, and now this new generation after uh, the year 2000, which uh, it's quite, quite different from from the others, maybe because it's also a time in which technology and science advance a lot, in which population increase also a lot in the last uh, let's say 15 20 years in in which changes in in humanity and um in the, in life in general evolve uh double from what had evolved be, uh, before these 20 years in the last uh, century so uh that's why i come at attention that yeah he he's actually talking about a different a generation uh, in all aspects of, of life. Uh, I don't know what you think about that, Ben, uh, about having uh, this big, big uh, difference from the others. What do you think about it? No, definitely. And I think if, uh, you know, he wrote a book called uh, Finding Your Element. And one of the things that he really promotes, like you're saying, is this way of trying to find ways to utilize all of the skills and abilities of, of a student and not so squarely... Uh, in terms of uh, you know reading and writing only, and and it skill and students have a lot of things to offer the educative experience, and it's really our job as educators within the school system, within some organized uh, fashion, to take advantage really of all of those those uh, skills and abilities. And yeah, he mentions how things have changed, how learners are different now than they are in the past. And that if we as educators within a formal educative ed educational system aren't aware of those changes and those, uh, you know, and, and we can talk about current technologies, but it's not just the current technologies themselves. It's but it's how how learners are communicating with each other. Technologies. How learners are uh, you know being entertained and how they receive information is a lot different than it used to be. And I think it's, uh, I think he really brings home this fact of how do we reach out uh, to those learners and try to get the most out of, the, of, of a particular class and look at what, what do the outcomes say about the learners? How do we, what kind of outcomes do we expect our students that are in line with not only formal objectives within a curriculum, for example, right. but also reaches out to maybe individual uh, objectives that, that we want to have our students maybe define themselves. And we've talked a little bit about this in other episodes, but how do we match those two objectives, the formal objectives from the curriculum and those individual objectives that we are encouraging our students to not only define themselves, but act and work towards. And, you know, we've seen we talked a lot about this a lot too. Is that you know sometimes students aren't even um, used to having the ability to uh, set up their own objectives. They've been so used to just uh, being hammered the curriculum objectives and and not even being offered the opportunity to uh, set their own objectives that they're not even and a lot of times uh, prepared to make some of those decisions. There's a lot of things here that I'm throwing out, but when we look at creativity, which is what he hones in a lot on, I think we're going to talk about that today more specifically. Um, I think it's important to that we as educators start this discussion and have an understanding of what is creativity and what it looks like. Because I would dare say that it's going to look quite different, uh, differently based on the type of class we're talking about, the type of teacher, a lot of other variables, maybe even even the institution, what kind of resources are available, et cetera. Right. Uh, you mentioned very important things there and, and, and detail, but yes, I agree with you with the idea of creativity, I guess. Uh, he mentions a little bit the idea of uh, having creativity, and I like also this, this term, uh, the idea of um, having imagination uh, 
having all your ideas and imaginations and thoughts uh, right there and having the ability to make them real, tangible somehow. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of rephrasing this, uh, but it's, uh, uh, and, and under that condition, if we are talking about imagination, if we are talking about your, your ability of thinking and, and um, oh, expanding your mind and then put it into action, we are talking about that creativity. It's uh, different from every single individual we have in the classroom and including all teachers and all people in the world. That would be one thing. The other thing you mentioned, which uh, which goes through one of the examples that uh, that, that uh, is stuck into my mind, it's uh, the way learners nowadays, the way they learn, the way they, they uh, the perception, the kind of perception they have, the means through which they, they acquire knowledge this time. He mentions an example about the Dalai Lama but what caught my one of the things that caught my attention in that example it's one small comment he makes, and uh, and maybe it's a little bit just part of of the conversation and it comes in the moment. But I found interesting the way he said it in in a very short phrase. He mentions that um, uh, well, the idea is that somebody asks a question to the Dalai Lama, and uh, and the idea is that he answers I don't know right. But the comment he makes is in a moment of this explanation he mentions like. Uh, he didn't think about, I'm going to Google that and I'm going to give an answer. That part was like, uh, maybe it was not his main point in that example, but in my mind, in, it came to me uh, to make a, a picture of, uh, I don't know if the generation, but at least this era in which it's so simple to Google it. In fact, it's one of the recommendations I, I, I give my students, Google it as you are thinking about it and then look for the source and then expand from there. Uh, so, and I've heard this before, the ability of reaching out for information, uh, to put it in my words, would be like, uh, it went beyond our ability. We never thought, we thought about, we never thought about how difficult would be to have all this information at hand, right? Uh, yeah, this is kind of a, uh, I'm gonna jump in here because this is very interesting, this idea of being able to Google it and, and maybe in generations past, this hasn't been an option, but you know, you can, a lot of things here to look at it. When we try to promote autonomous learning with our students, you know, we are encouraging them to go out and find the answer themselves. It's almost counter, intuitive because uh, even to this day I have a lot of students I feel that really expect me to give them all the answers they're still in that mindset that I'm the sage on the stage I'm the expert and every you know what I say goes and and that's that's it where many times we're trying to promote autonomous learning where students are going out and finding their the, their own answer and find their their finding their own way you know, and today with YouTube, just about any topic that you need to find, you can find with a click of a button. So uh, there, we need to really, really reevaluate what it is, you know, we're doing in the classroom. What are we teaching? What are our learners learning? And what kind of educative experience are we creating? What kind of opportunities are we creating for our students for them to take advantages of the technologies and really the openness of education that is our reality. Now you can argue that, well, some students have more internet access than others. And, and I understand that, but generally speaking, you know, there are opportunities, whether they have access in school at home in an internet cafe, you know, nowadays more and more, uh, you know, public places now are offering free internet. So, we're moving towards that uh, this open access of of having internet access, and I think we need to be prepared as teachers to embrace these changes and really look at these opportunities or look at these the realities as opportunities, and 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 use those to our advantage in the classroom. So maybe we don't have to speak so much and provide so much input. Uh, 
Whereas, you know, now maybe students can go and find some of that information on their own first. We talked about flipped learning. We had a really good discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was episode five back in the early days five. where uh, we had uh, Ken Bauer talk about the flipped learning experience. And this uh, for me is just screams flipped learning, uh, you know, concepts and principles. But it's really about trying to create that opportunity and have students uh, find their own way and help them and guide them through that process, but really be available on demand or teach on demand is what I, I like to think of it as. Right. Now, look at the dichotomy that comes here uh, with that simple phrase. That's why, why, why make me, it made me like uh, go on, on deep thoughts about this uh, simple thing. Like he didn't think about Google in it, like Google it. Because there's something I say, uh, don't get me wrong. My idea is that in our times, you didn't have Google. So you had to actually go to a library to get the information. And it would take time, a lot of time. It would take you time to go over there. Uh, for I, I, can, I, I would like to give my example because that's what I leave. So, so maybe you can picture yourself in something very similar. I'm picturing myself at home doing a homework in which I do not have the information at hand. So I had to walk out of my house, go to the corner, take the bus all the way down to the library or the university, which was uh, both ways, I mean, same, same distance, take like uh, 40 minutes to get there, and then start my research on the books that were available in that place. And then find out that I maybe I was not uh, prepared enough in library research or, or working my way around the library, but finding at most two books, three books about what I was concerned with after a while of exploration. Now, we can discuss a lot, and I don't wanna get into that because we can discuss a lot uh, about the richness of going through all of this process and going through different books to find at the end one or two, right? That's, that would be another story. But then at the end, what it comes is that whatever topic you were looking for, you have to stick to the book. That's the only thing you have. Now, if you had uh, a mind a little bit more developed and beyond, you could make your own perceptions about it. Though teachers in that time were asking you to empty knowledge from the books through to your paper. So not much creativity, right? But anyhow, you could develop a lot of creativity if you were like into um, questioning the author of the book. Well, not the author, but the information in the book, questioning yourself about it. So that was kind of fridge. But at the end, it was a limited and close knowledge for a long, long process. Now, yes, uh, as I mentioned, there's that would be another discussion to see how much you learn from other things around and not exactly about the topic, right? But now, uh, going back to the Google it, uh, I have, I'm having the perception that Google in it is the beginning of it. It's the beginning of this wide exploration. And then you are gonna have more than 20 sources on the same topic in just a couple of seconds. And you can start working your way out through it and see which is the most um, uh, relevant comment about the topic you want to research, uh, which is the, the common ground between different authors of different people all around the globe, from different countries, different perspectives, different cultures. Yes, but that's the perception I have as a teacher after all of these years working, right? I, I don't think students get the same perception from Google it. And, and, and I'm going through what you just say. Uh, we need to, uh, we, we, they come from a system in which they are used to uh, getting everything just at hand. And that's why they may, they may be expecting the teacher to give them all the information. So they Google it, they see the first line that appears when they Google it, and that's what they stick to. They don't question, they don't argue, they don't look for a second opinion, or the most they do is they look for a second uh, opinion, which would be the second line in Google. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if I'm making my point about this, how, how at the end, yes, it's what I tell them, 
but it has to be accompanied with a lot of persuasion and a lot of work with them in the sense that they have to go beyond the Google it. It's just the beginning. Well, yeah, and so th here's the thing, like Google offers all kinds of information, right? So students now have all kinds of information. Right. Now the opposite is true. They're actually uh, flooded with information where now they have to synthesize um, and be able to distinguish between what's valid and reliable information versus uh, invalid information. They need to be able to distinguish who the, maybe the, the speaker or the author is and be able to make a, a critical uh, summation or critical evaluation of that person to, to distinguish whether or not that person uh, knows what he or she is talking about. I mean, in, in the, the age of fake news, and I hate to use that term, but <laughs> you know, the idea is We've got a lot of information out there that students need to be able to not only find, because one of it, one thing is just to be able to find the information. Sometimes if they're not familiar with different search terms and different bullying searches or methods of, of, of finding information, a lot of times they're, they're just missing it. They're not actually able to find the information. If they're able to find information that they're interested in, that they need, then they have to be able to assess whether or not it's valid and then how does it fit into the rest of the information that they're trying to bring together? Again, this idea of analyzing and synthesizing information going back and forth between those two, it becomes essential even more so now in a day that we've got you know so much information available. So yeah, we have to guide stu students. And, and, and for me, that's just another opportunity. This is not a reason not to use uh, the the uh, use the current uh, technologies that we have available. This is really a, an opportunity for us. In fact, this is a, a skill that our students need uh, to have is to be able to manage technology, not just to be able to turn on the computer or, or obviously turn on their cell phone these days or being able to you know use a cell phone. It's being able to find the information using mobile devices in a way that they can. Uh, find purpose in in what they're doing in, in school. So this is not just a, a give me. This is not automatic. This is something that it's, this is a uh, competency that needs to be developed, and it needs to be developed in 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 any class. I mean, we're we're talking specifically English language learning. We haven't even talked about language development yet. But this is just uh, across the board, you know, competencies that students are needing in order uh, to do well. And these are going to translate, I think, very well, of course, to, to the real world because they're going to be needing to do uh, the same once they graduate and they're on a professional career path of their choice. Right. And, uh, and, and this is just a case in point. I mean, it's a crucial aspect about this difference in generations. I kind of, uh, I'm maybe somebody into history may maybe um, a lot more conscious about what I'm just about to say, but uh, I kind of believe that prior generations didn't have this this much information at hand, uh, and and whatever happened before, uh, like looking for the information, maybe the format was different, the way for looking for it was different, uh, but pretty much was uh, the same. I don't know, going to the masters and asking questions to the guides, to the mentors, passing knowledge from generation through generation, uh, getting knowledge from books. I think they all kind of relate in a very similar way. Um, obviously, well, there, there, there would be uh, important differences, right? But but pretty much it's it, it was kind of uh, the same uh, the same situation in, in the transmission of knowledge. Now, this generation has all the information there, all. <laughs> we can say, I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating, but, but let, let's take a 2% out of the all, but the information is out there. So information is not the problem. So this is, a, this is just a, an example and something crucial about the differences in generation. Uh, as, as you mentioned before, this may be overwhelming them. It's maybe too much to digest and, and different kind of abilities have to be learned, right? Well, we didn't have to worry before about, oh, I'm having too much information. How do I process this? Well, maybe we did, but it's, it was a minor 
amount. And uh, the point in here is jumping into the second important aspect that Ken Robinson makes in his talk. It's precisely related to all of this situation. We have a different generation, different needs, a different life situation. We're talking about knowledge passing through and knowledge, skills and attitudes pass through from generation through generation in a totally different way because they can even be raised by internet. We were, my generation was raised by TV. If you know how limited it is, like public TV, this generation has been raised by internet and Facebook. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that would be pretty much the picture. But the main point he makes is also the idea that the system, the educational system, is not designed properly to cover, uh, I don't want to get this wrong, uh, uh, and, and I want to state clearly, this is, my, this is a phrase, I, I, I'm trying to rephrase, right? Because may, I may be doing it wrong, but uh, the educational system is not designed to cover natural human needs according to our era, to our, to our time. The system is designed to have the students doing something specific at specific times in specific ways and do specific things required by teachers. And teachers are required by the program, the principal, authorities and whoever and he mentioned as examples of these natural things and that's why i perceive it's a natural need from humans the two main aspects one that uh nowadays kids are enclosed into their homes at difference from prior year years in which people used to be outside and kids used to be outside and because of any reason in these days there are research, and he talks about this research, in which is proven that kids stay at home all of the time. And they spend, and, and that's, <laughs> it was critical when I heard this, uh, kids spend less time than prisoners outside their homes. And that's something to worry about. Uh, and the other example he gives is that the school is designed to make people compete amongst each other. And he says a phrase which I like. He mentions that uh, schools are designed, are designed to make. Um, let me let me read it. Uh, I got it. Schools are designed to make people work in groups, not as groups. Now picture that. And all of this idea, I think that's why this this would be the second. Uh, well, the, the main aspect he mentions that. The system is not designed to cover needs. And, and if we go through the first idea, I tried to pull up like the, the, the idea of a different generation uh, with a different picture. We, we, we are just uh, understanding a little bit. Uh, this is something uh, like very crucial in education because at the end, the way he begins his talk is saying that the outcome we are having, the outcome we are having in schools is what we what we are designing schools for. I mean, we are doing the job. The question is, is the way the job is designed the correct way? Yeah, I, I I'm thinking about as you're mentioning, you're talking about groups and and yes. the, the tendency of students being more used to being at home and maybe isolated or at least. Uh, maybe not isolated in the sense of socially if they're being connected, because I'm assuming this kind of goes along with the idea that, okay, they might be at home more, but they're probably online and maybe interacting either on Facebook or gaming or some other uh, aspect. But um, I, I keep thinking about this semester, my class, uh, my prope class, you know, I had my students do a, a reflection. I taught a writing class this semester, and one of their assignments each week was to write a weekly reflection about their experiences for that particular week. And, you know, there would be some weeks where we would do group work, and invariably I would have some students, not all, some students really like to work in groups and uh, did well and, and expressed that. But there were some that were just not into it. They just didn't like working in, in groups and and I can certainly relate to that because I, I can recall working 
my master's working in groups and it always being more of a challenge. Uh, it was just more, it was difficult. It was just really hard to get everybody on the same page to, to get everything done. And, and I even remember, uh, when I was studying, uh, I studied briefly for, uh, MBA and it was all business related courses. And one of the classes for working in groups was actually to do a, or create a charter, a group charter. And in that group charter, you listed the members of the group, exactly who was to do what and when and how, I mean, it was all laid out in the, in the charter where it was very clear who was going to do what. And so I, I thought, well, you know, thinking about now with some of my students, I, I don't want to say necessarily that there's been a major shift in over the, you know, the last few years that I've been teaching. Um, I, I think that there's always been some students who have been more inclined to work in groups. They like it. Others like to work individually. But regardless, I think the ability to work in teams is something that they need to to learn and be able to, and even when it's difficult and even when maybe that there's some kind of conflict and, and going back to that group charter example that I, that we did, we actually in the charter, we, we wrote out if there were disagreements, how we would resolve those disagreements and everything was lined out in the charter, even before we started to work. So if problems were to arise, we knew from the very beginning how we would deal with those. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that's what needs to happen in all, in all cases, but I think it goes to the point that not everybody works well with others, you know, right. and you know, that's, that's, that's the real world. I mean, that's, that's, it was, that's there's no it. secret. But that's, I think we can, I can't, yeah, I just don't, I don't think we need, I don't think we should uh, just ignore the fact that just because we're in an educational scenario and students are quote unquote forced, okay, let's face it, they're, they're in the class because they paid for it and it's not just because they want to be there, they are automatically going to enjoy working in, in groups. So I think we need to be aware of that and be prepared and try to frame the, the task, the experience working in groups in a way that I think is versatile. That is really, I think, um, that recognizes the fact that some students are going to do well in those cases, in those types of situations and others are going to struggle. But that's the point. Why is it difficult to work in groups? Are we really developing this? Are we really focusing on the idea since the early ages? Are we really focusing on the idea of interpersonal relationships in that way as to work together for a mutual benefit? Are we really doing it? When he said this, this phrase, when he said we uh, in the schools, the schools are designed to make people work in groups, not as a group. I was thinking, uh, are the group activities we designed for the classroom really group activities? Or is it just a task that can be spread into pieces? And yeah. I mean, I so was this about, leads, yeah, this, yeah, this leads yeah. into, yeah, giving, you know, differentiated instruction, giving oh. students cho choices, giving them agency, giving them choices in what they, uh, even the outcomes to a degree, you know, um, you know, we have, again, stated outcomes that are required based on the curriculum, but we have to be able to give students some level of agency so that they can decide what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, and even maybe with whom they're going to do it in terms of who they're going to work with uh, in, in achieving that task. But I think that speaks to this level of uh, autonomy that we give students uh, based on their maturity level, based, of course, on the course itself, et cetera, but that we're not looking at it through just one lens as we right. uh, design these classes. Now, and this is just one, one case in point, again, about the idea of uh, not having the proper design kind of education as to, and now the, I think the point in here is to, to make people aware that uh, education and formal education is not just about knowledge, 
Uh, it's not about developing uh, job skills. It's about um, something that mentions our, our um, ideal here at the university is that education is integral and it integrates many of the aspects and it's an education for life. And, and that goes beyond the profession. If you go to primary schools, it goes beyond the schools. It goes way beyond uh, in the idea of creating human beings capable to live together and uh, develop together and, and reach uh, higher paths. He even differentiates the idea of uh, basing schools into standards and getting uh, recognition and certifications. And that means in closing people into one same path when the nature is to have this diversity, right? Uh, now, yes, that's why group work comes into action as important because we want all of this diversity, but we, we want these people also to be able to live together and do things together. And that's what pretty much called my attention about it. He, at the end of this talk that I, that I shared with you at the beginning, he mentions an example about soil, about uh, how we are uh, destroying certain aspects by the idea of having the same kind of products in the same ground over and over again, when the nature is to have different kind of fruits, vegetables, and plants in the soil according to the region, yes, but a wide variety. He mentions a large number of variety in plants and human beings depending on only 11 of them. And, and I think that's a good analogy of what may be happening, right? Uh, uh, I'm not saying it's, it, it's something um, uh, wild word, but I would go, I, I would stand on that side with him, with the idea that, uh, uh, and this is where creativity comes, the idea of creativity comes, that creativity is limited. If at the beginning I mentioned my idea of creativity being uh, as diverse as, the number of human beings in the planet, and you having your schools getting uh, getting getting students towards the same standard. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I'm all I'm all for having certain standards and uh, indicators and and aspects that we have to measure, right? But we also need to understand all of this diversity. But at the same time, again, there there's there's a, a counterpart. At the same time, we need to understand that that diversity has to be able to come together to have good outcomes for everybody, for society and for individuals at the same time. So that's pretty much uh, what it's going on uh, 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 in this talk and that what he uh, like puts into a lot of examples. Uh, I see it like kind of a, a well paused talk with few ideas and uh, long examples. I mean, once, but, but it makes his point on that. And uh, and I was taking that into into my classroom. I was I was thinking about my classes in in my with my students this semester. I was working with teaching worship, which is the first time they do teaching. They teach amongst each other in simulated classes, but they had the opportunity in another class to go outside at least once to teach a real group. They're, they have another subject uh, from the area of education, and the teacher required from them to go to a real school and have a class with the students. And uh, let, me, let me let me ask you yes. here. I'm I'm curious because I let's look let's take um let's take those students that you're you're referring to. Right. And these are students who are just starting the the teaching process in this practicum class. So they're working with their fellow classmates for the most part. These same students have observed in prior semesters, they've observed other classes, correct? They've looked right. at how other teachers have taught, and of course, they've had their own experiences as English language learners uh, to draw on. And I'm wondering if you currently talk to your students about this idea of creativity in terms of what either they've you know witnessed and experienced personally in the past or any type of consideration that they are taking into account this particular semester, you know, what it means, what, what does creativity mean uh, in, in within the context of their own teaching at this stage of their development? I'm curious it, what the role of creativity is for these particular uh, types of students at this stage of their training. 
Uh, we mostly talk about creativity in terms of their creativity to prepare a class, but it focuses on the idea of the, uh, their creativity, not as to have complex things or or material that it's uh, all uh, detail and structure and that you have to do a lot of things with it, not just for the sake of it or, or things like, or, or just in that, in, in that sense, but more in the idea that the class has to be created enough as to cover all students' needs and profiles. Creativity enough as to adapt one same topic and, uh, and one, uh, Mm, let's say one task according to students' needs. Now, from the point of view of their students, their, stu their language students, uh, we do not discuss creativity like, like in that term, but we go through a lot of things about individuality and the nature of humans. Like, for example, a case of, uh, just a case that happened uh, in, in the last week. They went to, uh, to teach this class in the real classroom and they came to me for advice because they, they went, uh, I think they had two or three classes. They, they had to go two or three days. And, uh, and they, in the first day, they immediately pictured this in area and they realized that things could be totally out of control for the next two classes. Uh, but one case specifically would be one kid that would stand up just because of the sake of standing up and moving around the classroom. And they were surprised because of this. And, and uh, we have to go through the idea that it's a natural state of kids. I mean, you, don't, you cannot have them sit it for a whole hour and have them to be quiet and still for a whole hour. And they, but they were amazed by the fact that this kid would just stand up go to another place in the classroom and then go back to his seat and sit down. And that started the conversation about what kind of activities were they designing for these kids? What would they expect? Yeah, from that's, kids? yeah that's what I'm, I'm curious about. If you change the conversation more to creativity in terms of their own learners, uh, quote unquote learners, because for now this particular yeah. group is their, right. their classmates, but, but still like a role play, think about you know, what kind of design and, and lesson planning would occur if the conversation started with the creativity of their own students and see where that led? I mean, is that, are they, is that, are they in a position to have that conversation? No, we haven't really discussed uh, creativity in, in specifically openly for uh, cre students' creativity as in that term. But yeah, we've been, we've been, mentioning a couple of things and i've been mentioning a couple of things which we discussed later uh about for example the idea of uh having different options and having the students decide certain things along the classroom and the difference between uh giving them two options which is not really <laughs> may not be really an option we're gonna do this or we're gonna do that uh, uh, so what we're gonna do and that's not really uh, and that's not exploding uh students creativity right but really thinking about uh, from the point of view, what's your creativity as a teacher for designing your class mean, would mean like uh, how much you are letting your students to be also creative and participate and, and, and start from themselves. But uh, now that you mentioned it, I think maybe a topic that we have to address specifically, totally specifically uh, looking for this beginning. Uh, now that you mentioned uh, beginning the class with creativity, uh, yes, we've had this question. Right, but if, before, because I bet it was another semester, whatever. What were some examples? So, sorry, I cannot hear you. It's the it, it's all choppy and I, I cannot hear you, Ben. Your image is fr is frozen and it's all choppy. I don't know if it's your end or my end. Oh, wow. Yeah, Ben, are you there? The learning. Can you now the, your image? Can you, can you listen can you to me? me? I, I hear me. 
Maybe uh, cut your video, PD, for now. Okay, now I'm listening to you. Yeah. Yeah, the video was frozen and you were kind of choppy in there. Can you hear me now? Uh, I still a little bit cut it, but uh, go Check. on. Check. Okay, I don't know how much you got, but I'm, I'm, Not, okay. I was basically. Can you repeat it all? Because I didn't get any. <laughs> okay. Yeah, basically what I was I was talking about was that um, I'm wondering if you had the same group and you had conversations that were dealing with their prior experiences with creativity, but from from the learner's standpoint. So if they they could either draw on personal experiences as uh, learners or maybe our semester different teachers in action, but have that conversation about what is creativity and think of it in terms of the learners only, not necessarily the teachers. I know that you're, you, you work a lot with uh, creativity on how they design uh, you know, their, their classes, but I'm, I'm curious about the, the, the idea of creativity as learners because I'm wondering if it's enough to talk about creativity on the, in terms of pedagogy without having the conversation of uh, creativity in terms of, of the learning. I wonder if we start with the learning first and then build something around that, what would happen? How would that look different in terms of uh, design class, uh, design uh, of classes and uh, you know using materials or whatnot? But that's what I'm curious about. Even at this stage, this early stage. Oh, okay. you went off again. I, I, I can't not listen yeah. to you. Can you hear me? Now, nah, yeah. Okay. You know the the term creativity is one that I kind of go back and forth with, and honestly, I I don't use the term that much because um, it's so wide open and it's so relative and subjective that it almost becomes uh, unless they're unless we're talking very concretely in 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 terms of something very specific. Uh, the term can very easily be, oh, well, uh, this class was creative or that experience was creative when we don't really know exactly what was, you know, how, to what degree uh, creativity actually uh, really took place. So I think that, um, yeah, I, I think that when we use the word creativity, especially in language classes, we need to be very specific and in terms of what kind of performance test is being uh, being conducted and what kind of language goals are being achieved and what kind of other goals that maybe are not l linguistic but mm -hmm. that are also part of the, the, the learning experience are also part of the the, the process you know and, and to be very specific if right. we're looking at students for example presenting a country and they're they're creating all of the props that is in, in creating all of that uh, experience. A lot of that is non, it's not related to uh, language necessarily. You know, it's it's the visuals, but it's not related specific to language, which is fine. But when we look at creativity, certainly that's part of the creative process and, and it's certainly valid and it's part of the learning process. But I think that as educators, we need to be able to understand what creativity is and what the relationship is to all of the outcomes that make up that performance task, though even those that are not language related. I mean, it's all related to language, but it's not part of the language, you know. And so, a lot of times we get caught up in the the language only, and we don't take into consideration of the other aspects. Sometimes we take too much we take too much stock in the visuals and how, what it looks like, and we actually ignore the the language. So it, it's that balance of being able to bring in creativity. But in the language classroom, making sure that there's a good uh, balance of uh, feedback and, and assessment on the language development, because that's part of it, and also the, the understanding content uh, knowledge that they're also gaining from that experience. Yes, I totally agree with you. I, and, and I think uh, somehow discussions come about different topics and, and we, we go 
we we cover a little bit some ideas about yes about the the creativity from students but yeah you remember mainly in this in this subjects in these early subjects we are doing simulated classes uh, with the students with their they their classmates and the objective is mainly to start developing uh, basic skills to direct the class but yes i totally agree with you it would be an important moment to start uh, uh, discussing about these aspects and see how much students, uh, what students think about it. What do, how do they perceive uh, from their point of view as prior students and, uh, and try to, to make this conversion into now the focus uh, we want them to have as teachers on everything they do. And I think it would be important because the, yes, again, uh, as this example, are we really doing the right task the way they are supposed to be? In, in other words, in this case, um, maybe it's too late when we start discussing about uh, the individuality and the creativity of students in a deep way, and maybe it would be important to start right away with that. I don't know. I mean, it's a compendium of things uh, because at the end, it's also uh, how are m my teachers going to take my teacher students, how, how are they going to take it? How are they going to perceive it at this stage after they come from the system itself? Uh, are they really having this? Um, uh, I, I mean, as you mentioned before, as an example, you mentioned before they are waiting for you. Uh, they, some of them expect you to give all the information. Now, this may go different ways, but some of them may be that they expect you to be the master and commander. Uh, the almighty in the classroom and they would take your work for granted or it may be that um all right i know this uh the teacher is going to grade me so i'm going to just go for whatever he says and because they've been used to it in the system so under this kind as an example under this kind of condition how are they going to really make an interpretation at certain stages i don't know but um but uh it's worth a try i mean uh, the earlier the better <laughs> Yeah, and, and I just throw that out there as something to think about. Like, you know, I think it's never too early to talk about creativity because right. I think it's a good term to to you know to to consider and to d discuss, of course. But it really needs to be brought into a very contextualized and specific, uh, you know, ideal set of circumstances, so that you know the the teacher really knows exactly what's uh, you know what they're getting out of. Of, of this this experience now today we've talked about a lot about in uh, input and how students can find innovative ways maybe to find information or the importance of really being very selective in that but whenever we talk about outcomes and what kind of things that they produce that's also part of the creative process and what what it means to be creative so they can be creative in finding and getting the information they can be creative in the outputs that they create and we need to, I think the big takeaway for me in today's discussion is really how can I as a teacher bring those inputs and outputs into the creative process? How can my students be creative in the uh, learning of information and, and, and learning of new language and the output specifically? What are they going to be asked to do in my class? And how can they express their levels of creativity based on the individual needs and interests and and specialities really of each each student because I think each student has something to offer uh, even if they lack uh, some language uh, we that we not only we that we just don't look at students language but we look at their full potential so that they we can bring in that full potential in, into the learning experience for others to learn it's uh, important not to ignore that students learn a lot uh amongst themselves right they learn mostly uh, you know through their own experiences that we hopefully help create as teachers but it's really the students themselves so when they bring in those extra talents that maybe before were not recognized but now we do recognize it within the educative assist uh, educative uh, environment i think all the students win i think they all learn from that uh, experience so, right man. For me, that's kind of the takeaway from uh, today's discussion for me. I like, I like the discussions and I like the way they go through because uh, most of the time 
it even looks like a script, right? Like you and I uh, really have a script and, and organize what you're going to say, what I'm going to say, but it's not. It's just a natural happening. And I'm saying this because uh, this final thing that you mentioned takes me to the third point I wanted to make about his talk. And uh, and this is something that I think we're going to keep on discussing and, and maybe the next the next episode or, or whenever we have time, we're going to go through this because it's a wide thing. But it goes to what you say, how how to enhance creativity, how to how to promote it, how to really have it. And he mentions and that's the key. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's a key sentence of his talk. He says that uh, learning it's not a monologue. Learning it's a conversation. It's a relationship amongst people. How do you promote creativity? How do you bring up all of this from the students and from yourself also to the classroom? Communicating, having a conversation instead of a monologue, changing the idea of precisely the teacher being the one master and commander at front and having all of this uh, different dynamics and paths to have a real exchange with the students of insights what do you believe what do i believe how do we put it on the table how do we combine this idea or how do we um put this on the table aside a uh, hand-to-hand with authors and experts and make our minds about whatever is going on in order to be able to go and try something and then come back and discuss again yeah yeah definitely i think that uh having a conversation is important i think this is one of those things that might be easy to say hard to do yes. depending on the, the situation but i think this is something we need to talk a lot more about um and really get to the details of what this means to have a discussion to be right. accessible as teachers and and also be accessible as students having them be open enough to accept the conversation, to accept a discussion, not only teacher to student, but student to student, and having that, that uh, be available in a very transparent, open way. Right, I think, uh, I think if we keep on talking about that, we're gonna spend another couple of hours, so, but the time has catch up, man. And uh, I would like to discuss this in in a further uh, in a further program episode because uh, I think there's a lot to say about this idea of collective uh, learning, about interacting, discussing, and because uh, it includes. I mean, it is it is all. I mean, as you mentioned, it's simple to say. It's a big deal. Yes, and if anyone has any experiences or thoughts on the matter, feel free to reach out to us. If you want to share uh, some of your classroom experiences and how you have brought in some collective experiences and collective learning where students are uh, having this discussion and that you are being accessible to your students, we'd love to hear from you and from your experiences. So reach out to us. Let us know on Facebook. Leave us a message. Let us know if you want to be part of the chat. We'd love to have a guest on. Uh, those are always a lot of fun. So uh, let us know if you want to be part of the conversation. And uh, we're even open to uh, scheduling a time other than Saturday mornings. Those are the mornings that we usually set for us to have a discussion. But if for some reason your schedule does not permit having a discussion on Saturday mornings, we're certainly open to uh, scheduling something at another time. So reach out to us. We really want uh, to have this uh, community of educators who are interested in sharing uh, their experiences with others uh, to be really the goal of Teacher Learning Cast. Yes, Ben. I would like just to acknowledge uh, the credit of this of of this talk. I, I had the official page at UCLA, which is the page for the Center for the Transformation of Schools. And there's precisely. I mean, this is uh, uh, we are not here at Teacher Learning Cast for uh, for profit in in any sense. But I, I like to acknowledge that uh, this is the source and also TED Talks. 
uh, with uh, the or the talk that originated all this boom from Ken Robinson around, uh, which was do school skill creativity. It's a short talk which uh, if you haven't seen. You should do it. Uh, and I also want to thank all people that passed by in a moment or a different uh, at a point during this talk. Uh, Patti Martinez, Alex Hernandez, Carmen Llamas, Ernesto Diaz, uh, Bert Rodriguez, Diane uh, Ramos, or Diana Ramos, uh, Carlos Herrera, Ceci Quesada, Agueda Luciana, Rafa Espinosa, Michelle Hasso, Abraham, uh, Andres, thank you very much for staying with us for a short moment and on Facebook Live. You can join us in the talk whenever you want. Ben, Thank you very much for this uh, lovely talk. I enjoy always your points of view. You have um, a very nurturing way of putting things and, and, and uh, a, a very nice way to set things to get going. Yes, thank you, Petey, for sharing this uh, this video with us. Definitely very insightful. I always learn a lot from these discussions. And uh, again, I just want to thank everybody uh, for... Uh, joining us today, and uh, we will see you in the next broadcast. Keep on learning.